We're going to hear what God has to say to us today based on the verse and passage that the gems have been looking at this past year. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to start reading at verse 6. The gems verse is verse 12. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May He strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all His holy ones. So verse 12 is the gems verse. I'll read that one more time. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other And for everyone else, just as ours does for you. These verses here, 11 through 13, this is a brief prayer for the church in Thessalonica. Thessalonians was a letter written to the church in a city called Thessalonica. That's uh, in modern day Greece today. And uh, this is just a brief prayer for them that their faith and that their love would would overflow. In verse 4, Uh, Paul knew that these people were undergoing some persecutions and some trials and difficulties. And so in verse 5, he was was concerned rather that those trials had maybe stifled their faith and maybe made them weaker and not believe much anymore because they were being persecuted. But Timothy came back to them and brought them good news that no, their faith and love is, is growing and it's doing really well. They still believe and they're strong in their faith. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy, it says, we were encouraged in verse 7 and even elated. They were, how can we thank God enough for all the joy that you've brought us? They heard that they were persevering in spite of their trials and that was very encouraging to them. So Paul bursts into this prayer for them. And part of this prayer is that he prays for love to overflow in them, in their lives, for one another and for everyone else. I'd have wanted to point out one thing here. It says, may your love overflow. Um, It's not really their love, though. That's just a manner of speaking. In, in the Greek, it's, it's a little more like this. This is a different translation. It's, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. There's, it's the love of God that fills them, that overflows for everyone else. It's not self-generated love. It's, it's love that God has given to us and then we pass that on. In 1 John chapter 4, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And then a couple of verses later, in verse 19, it says, We love because He first loved us. The reason why we love is because somebody else loved us. And so we get this chain reaction here going. But the world... The world gets love wrong. And so when we're out and about and when we're just going about our lives, we get these messages of, of love that's, that's not exactly right. This is Lady Gaga. And she has this advertisement out that says this is what love is. I ran across that just last week. It's 
part, something called the Love Project. It's through Revlon and stuff like that. So in this advertisement, she says, and some others say, love is some different things. So love is embracing everything you are. Love is being at my grandma's house. Love is education. Love is finding your voice. Love is feeling safe. Love is women. Love is all we have. This is what the world's version of love is. So love according to Revlon, they got this whole campaign going here. So in the boxes that they ship out, they want you to think of, uh, they want you actually to tweet what you think love is in, in three words. And so they say, um, this is in one of their tweets, love is powerful. It's anything you cherish. It's a story you share in three words. So, just for fun, I thought, oh, let's see what people think love is. So, found a bunch of them here. There's, there's one, love in three words, smiling faces, sunshine, and good health. So you're supposed to, when you get their box, you're supposed to say love in three words, and then you write in that, and you take a picture, and you tweet that picture with that hashtag, right? So smiling faces, sunshine, and health, that's what one person thought love was. There's another one, tacos, tacos, hot sauce. I didn't know that's what love was. Apparently, that's what love is. There's another one. Uh, family, beauty, and Amazon is what that one says. Another one here. That uh, one's a little cut off. Laughter, honesty, and companionship. Apparently, that's what love is. Another one here. This one has a nice picture of some roses with it. Kindness, acceptance, and peace. And here's another one. This one had a little message here with it. Uh, always be yourself. Life is too short to be anything but happy. Surround yourself with people who want you to excel. Excel at what? I don't know. But I especially like this picture. This is fascinating to me. Family, life, and God. God's in third place here. Isn't that interesting? God's your, your afterthought. But there was one person that I found who I thought got it right. Let's look at that one. Jesus, our Redeemer. Yes. A plus. Good job. If you, I don't know if you get Revlon stuff or if you tweet or anything like that, but if you, if you get that and you want to take a picture and do that, put, put something like this on there. That's a, that's a good one. Jesus is love. He's the definition of what love is. He is God the Father's love to us. And He has saved us from our sins. So anyways, just considering what most people think love is, the world's love is mostly about good feelings. Feeling good is what love is in terms of what most people think of it anyway. So it's kind of like having this buzz, and, and don't kill my buzz. If you do, then that's not loving. But the reality is that feelings come and go. They shift. They shift with the wind. And they're often selfish. If all you're interested in is keeping your good feeling buzz going, you're not going to be thinking about other people as much. And not everything that feels good is good. And not everything that feels bad is bad. The love of God is everlasting and tangible, by contrast. God's love is not like our love. We think love is usually about good feelings and, and feeling good about ourselves and others and that sort of thing. But God's love is, not, is a little different than that. It's bigger than that, actually. God's love never, doesn't change at all. There's times when God doesn't necessarily feel so happy about things that we do or anything, but that doesn't take His love away from us. And God's love is tangible. You experience God's love every single day. In fact, every single second. We all do. If you're breathing, eating, warm, and safe, for instance then God is being good to you. You are experiencing God's love. 
So if, you, if you're taking a breath right now, God loves you. It's, it's really a miracle that all of these things come together in our lives so that we can breathe, that we can eat, and that we can be warm and safe, among many other things, of course, but here's just some examples. God loves us, and God loves all people in these ways. In, in, in these ways, God's love is universal. It's, it's for everyone. And everybody experiences God's love in very tangible ways all the time. We don't always remember that these things come from God, but they actually do. And they are signs that God cares for us and loves us. But God's love doesn't stop there, though, either. God has a special love for His own people. Those people who believe in Him and accept Him. God has a special love for His own people. Jesus said, said in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He knows us, and we know Him. And despite our rebellious sin, God chooses to save us. That's amazing. In Romans 5, 6 through 8, it says, Christ died for the ungodly. The ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's incredible. This is love that that's way beyond us, beyond what we can understand. God the Son became one of us and took our penalty upon Himself. God took a penalty that we deserved when He was perfectly innocent. He took on sin and death and He overcame them. Those are our worst enemies. Sin and death. Sin separates us from God and death is the penalty of sin. And these are the things that we would ultimately dread. But God took those on and He defeated them. It's because He loves us. And you know what? He didn't even stop there. It's not like He he died for us and took our sins away and took death away from us. He, He goes even farther than that. Look at, uh, look at the screen here with me if you would. Why is He called, that's Jesus, why is He called God, God's only Son when we are also God's children? Because Christ alone is the eternal, natural Son of God. We, however, are adopted children of God. Adopted by grace through Christ. So we have not only our biggest enemies taken away, we have some huge blessings on top of that. All believers now have all the privileges of God's own sons and daughters. We weren't just made okay with God. God actually takes us in and makes us His own. We're part of God's family even. It means we have all the rights and privileges of being children of God. Everything that goes along with that. We, we take prayer for granted quite a bit. You know, we can just bow our heads wherever we are and we can just talk to God. That's amazing that we can do that. Because if sin alienates us from God, if we basically by our sin has declared ourselves enemies of God, and and God bridges that gap, and not only bridges the gap, but He makes us His own so we can just walk up to God and talk to Him whenever we want to. And He hears us. We maybe we don't think too much about that. But that's that's incredible. It's amazing that we as sinners can go before God 
and say, God, I, I got something to say to you. I, I, I need you to listen to me. And God will listen. It says in John 1, 12 and 13, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. We are spiritual children of God, adopted by grace in Christ. This is, this is amazing love, people. This is, this is love that, that goes beyond what we can fully understand. This is, this is love that is just wondrous. Dying for enemies to make them children. Dying for enemies to make them children. Could you imagine, for example, dying for, let's say, the leader of ISIS? to make that person your family? That's insane. But that's essentially what God has done for us. That's, that's, that's amazing. He forgave us all our sins. He canceled the written code that was against us. And foregoing any good feelings... The son gave himself to the worst death possible to make that happen. And the father, he had to stand back and watch. He had to watch that happen. If you know this love, this love of God, then that love changes you, doesn't it? You're not the same person when you dwell on what that means. Changes everything that life is for you. This love of God is now poured into our hearts so that we would love in the same way. Romans 5, verse 5. God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. It says it right there, directly. If God has poured this love into your heart, then I hope that this love overflows in your life. With God's love, we now have a radically different attitude to life. I hope this is true for you. There's some verses that the gems have been looking at over this past year. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You adopt a whole new attitude. If you are holy and dearly loved in the sight of God, then you have this new attitude to life. James 1.19 My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If this is how God has loved us, there's not a whole lot that we have to get upset about anymore. We don't have a lot of pride that we have to defend anymore. We can be slow to be angry and we can be quick to listen. We can even do some pretty radical things too. Matthew 5, this is Jesus talking, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt... Hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. If God has loved us, then the things that we would otherwise battle over and try to grab onto and accumulate, these things don't really matter anymore. If you have the Lord, then all of these other things become very secondary. And by giving up something that would otherwise be very valuable, people can see how much more valuable God is. With God's love, we will forgive as the Lord forgave us. Some radical forgiveness here. Bear with each other and forgive one another 
If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's, that's a lot of forgiveness that we're called to. And there's a lot of terrible things that go on in this world. But if Jesus has died for our sins, if that's, if that's true, then that means sin is defeated in our lives. That means it, it doesn't define us. It doesn't dictate who we are. It doesn't dictate how we act. It does not rule us. We are no longer slaves to sin. It's no longer our master. And it also doesn't dictate how we relate to one another either. If sin is not our master. We relate to each other according to how God is related to us. Which is entirely different. With God's love, we will serve one another too. Jesus, on that night that he was betrayed, he became a servant. It says that he put a towel around his waist and he did a job that nobody wanted to do. He washed all of his disciples' feet. And when you walk around in a desert climate with sandals, that's kind of gross. I haven't done that myself, but it doesn't sound very appealing. And Jesus did that. And then afterwards, he said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So the, the highest king of not just any country, but of the whole universe, makes himself a servant and washes our feet. And one of those people whose feet that he washed was Judas Iscariot too. Jesus washed Judas Iscariot's feet that night right before Judas was about to sell him out to be crucified. Wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall and see how that went? In our lives, the love that we show reflects the love that we know. We've all experienced love in, in some way. We all have certain understanding of what love is. Maybe we've received love from, from our parents or our friends, other family members, maybe our church community. But we have people who've shown us love and we kind of grow up with this idea about, okay, this is what love is. And some people who have grown up in some pretty rough environments, they have a pretty warped idea about what love is. Because they've never really experienced it before. There are some people out there who really need to know what real love is about. So the love that we would show somebody else is the love that we have, we have received ourselves. And so, as it relates to God, if we're forgiven much, then we will love much. If we're given just a little bit, if we just have a few sins to be forgiven, nothing huge, then we're not going to love as much either. There was a woman who was, who was very sinful and known all around town for all of the bad things that she had done, and she goes and she washed Jesus' feet, and people were mumbling, look at, look at this woman, look at so-and-so, look what she's doing, and Jesus is letting her wash her feet. You know, he, she's going to contaminate him with all of her sins. And Jesus said, no, no, that's not, that's not right. She, she, she's showing love to me, washing my feet like this. And then he said something interesting. I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. So, this means that 
to whatever extent that we are aware of God's love for us, that's the love that we will show other people. So if we've only done a couple things wrong in our lives and don't have a whole lot to be forgiven, we're good people. If we're good people and God doesn't have a lot to forgive us, we're not going to be very loving. Because we're good people. We don't need a lot of forgiveness. God, we, we're good people. But if, if we know how devastating our sin is, how, how terrible it is, even if we might otherwise think it's just small and tiny, we're going to love people radically like God has loved us. And so, let's know the depth of our sin to know the depth of his love. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He says, I am the worst of sinners here. Does that mean that he actually was the absolute worst sinner who's ever walked this earth? No. I I don't think that you could say that. But what he did do, he knew how devastating his sin was. And that illuminated the vastness of God's love in his life. I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. He wasn't necessarily the worst of sinners. There's some terrible people out there. But he knew how devastating sin was and how he had offended God and what that means So know your sin so that you can know how much God really loves. And know the depth of His love so that you can show His deep love to this thirsty world. There's a world out there that needs to know what God's love is really about. There's a lot of people who don't really know what love is. Some people have been abused a lot and they think, Love means abuse. And there's other people who think that love is just good feelings all the time. And so they don't have any concept of boundaries or, or discipline or self-control or anything like that. There's, there's a lot of wrong ideas about what love is out there. I came across this, this verse from Isaiah. It says, I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. When God pours out his love into our hearts, we blossom. The more you know what God has done for you, the more you will blossom in your walk with the Lord. So let's not show shallow love of good feelings. Let's show the wondrous love of Jesus Christ that God has shown us. This love is steadfast. This love is committed. And it shows love that is very tangible and it's very real and that overflows into our lives so that we can show what real love is to others. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, you are are very loving to us. And the greatest example of your love is obviously Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Lord, help us to realize the depth of that sacrifice and the depth of the love that it took to go to that cross so that we would be saved 
and that we as sinful enemies of you could become even your beloved children. Help us to understand what that means. May that touch each of our hearts and that, Lord, we would better love you and that we would better love one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.